All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for uh, Philip Schaefer's TED Talk, Honeysuckle Sucks. And at this moment, I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight him and let him take it away. All right. Once I, there we go. All right, um, thank you everybody for coming out. Uh, it means a lot to me that uh, you care so much about plants and, oh, uh, Oh, did something I didn't want to do. Uh, and thanks for Meredith uh, for setting this up. Um, really appreciate that and um, asking me to do this. Uh, so this is kind of, um, you know, part one of uh, Earth Day celebration. Um, so Sunday service is also uh, very similar and hopefully the more uplifting version of uh, what this is. Um, so uh, to kind of jump into it, um, what I do, uh, I want to talk about that for a second, uh, is uh, largely kill honeysuckle, uh, just getting it rid of it uh, wherever I can. And um, by honeysuckle, I mean um, the bush honeysuckle or the amur honeysuckle, uh, scientific name, uh, Lonicera macchii. Um, and there are native honeysuckles, but I've never seen one in the wild, uh, so they're not uh, common anymore. Um, another thing that I do is uh, lead a group called Friends of French Park, uh, which is at French Park, obviously, uh, which is in Amberley, uh, but it's a city of Cincinnati Park. Um, and I also uh, love to talk about plants. Uh, so Rebecca really appreciates you all listening to uh, this so that uh, I don't have to keep talking about plants with her over and over again. Um, <clears throat> so some of the history of honeysuckle, and we're going to stray away from honeysuckle a little bit as well and get into kind of the history of uh, ecology in uh, southwest Ohio and Ohio and the Midwest in general. Um, but uh, honeysuckle itself uh, is um, a small tree from chi from China. Uh, came to New York in the 1800s, late 1800s. Uh, it was meant to be like an ornamental tree, uh, but they um, foresters um, uh, found pretty quickly that it was grew pretty much everywhere. Uh, so they used it a lot for erosion control and kind of spread it everywhere. Uh, and at the time, uh, forestry theories were largely uh, based around like in the individual tree and the that health of the that one tree, and then um, much less so on the health of the entire ecosystem and how things um, are symbiotic and work with each other and um, all that stuff that we understand today. Um, so. Uh, a little bit about uh, the M Mount Airy Park. I want to. I'm going to jump around a little bit, um, but it um, is very similar to um, French Park in that it was also uh, probably for all forested at one point, uh, pre colonization, and then largely clear cut, and then used as agricultural lands for a long time. Uh, so in the early 1900s, um, there was some movement to uh, kind of build up the forests in the area and um, often uh, times use them as uh, like timber sources, uh, which is a very valuable resource that was declining in the uh, 1900s, early 1900s. Um, but uh, at that time in the early like 1910s, uh, there were a lot of um, volunteers, like gardening clubs and stuff like that, as well as um, efforts from the Cincinnati Park system uh, to completely replant these farms. Uh, so there are pictures of like hundreds of volunteers out in the fields with acorns and just like little little trowels, like burying acorns in the middle of these fields. And uh, then in the 1930s, it really picked up steam. Uh, where we had the Civilian Conservation Corps come in uh, with uh, 200 uh, employees, and uh, they really uh, built up the forest um, and uh, moved things around sometimes. Uh, sometimes there were, um, they, earlier they planted like 
an entire stand of trees of one species. So they were starting to understand that different species um, should be mixed in with each other. Um, and also um, in at least one record that we have from that time, uh, they the um, city park system planted uh, like 5,000 honeysuckle for erosion control in Mount Airy, uh, which is our largest park uh, for Cincinnati at uh, like 1,400 acres. Um, so that was kind of like the highlight of engagement uh, in our park system and government support and kind of, um, public support uh, as uh, for creating new parks and new forests and that kind of thing. Um, a decline kind of started uh, after World War II. Uh, there was still some engagement, um, but uh, the city itself had fewer resources because of things like white flight. Uh, the general tax base of the city was lower and uh, things got cut, uh, such as parks. Um, uh, as well as parks leadership, not prioritizing the forests. Um, oftentimes uh, it was like play areas or common areas, grass, mow the grass, that kind of thing. Um, and we didn't really understand honeysuckle until it was too late and had kind of spread um, out through everywhere. Um, another reason that it became so common uh, in our parks is uh, this idea that like nature knows best and nature will fix itself and that kind of thing. And uh, we have really let that idea go uh, for a long time and ended up with our parks just completely covered in honeysuckle. Um, honeysuckle, I believe, uh, based on a recent survey, is like the number one plant in uh, Hamilton County. Uh, and I won't really get into a lot of the specifics of honeysuckle, um, but I'm happy to talk about that uh, some other time. Uh, I'll talk your ear off about uh, how honeysuckle is like super aggressive and has like chemical warfare tactics against other plants and all that stuff. Um, but that's not really uh, in this talk tonight. Um, so jumping back in time again, uh, Ohio um, used to be like pre-colonization was about 95% forested. Uh, if you drive up uh, through I-75, I-71, wherever, uh, it's really hard to imagine that because it's just flat farmland these days. Uh, but at one point, uh, again, it was 95% forest. Uh, the other percent was like uh, marshes, uh, bogs, and prairies. Uh, the forest canopy hit its low point around 1940 uh, at about 10%. And then uh, again, that coincided with like Mount Airy and people realizing like, oh, maybe we shouldn't destroy the entire forest system in Ohio. Uh, so then <clears throat> there were some efforts uh, to rebuild the forest, regrow the forest. Uh, Ohio is about 30% forest today. Most of it uh, in the Appalachian region, um, southwest, southeast Ohio. Um, and then the other thing that uh, happens along the way is just like uh, so much, we've done so much development uh, in addition to the agriculture that has uh, really destroyed a lot of really amazing uh, like biodiverse gems. Uh, so we have these two surveys from uh, like early 1800s and early 1900s. And in them, um, they talk about like all these like native wild orchids and all these really amazing uh, plants and flowers and things that we uh, used to have around here and they're just completely gone. And um, there's a UC professor going around kind of checking on these sites that these two previous uh, biologists had checked on, um, had done surveys on, and he's finding that they're just like parking lots now or subdivisions or um, that kind of thing. Like we just completely have destroyed them. Um, another thing that has really hurt our forests is uh, the invasive species that we don't usually think of, such as um, emerald ash borer has pretty much wiped out 
all of the ash trees. Uh, and then you have like Dutch elm disease and um, the chestnut blight uh, that wiped out a good number of the elm trees and pretty much all of the chestnut trees, uh, which used to grow to like 10 feet in diameter commonly. Um, so th those really uh, impacted our forests in a negative way and uh, helped kind of clear the way for all of these invasive species to come in. Um, we also have the rise of like lawns and pesticide usage and uh, non-native landscape uh, plants. Um, in French Park, as I'm just going through, I see all these different landscaping plants. Um, I wrote out a whole list of invasive plants, but I'm not going to go through it right now. But some that I want to highlight are um, calorie pear, which is the species name for Bradford pear. Uh, I mean, we just find those all over. Um, privet, which is uh, a European plant um, commonly used in landscaping. Uh, burning bush, which is the plant, the bush that turns red in um, autumn. Uh, we just have like hundreds of those in French Park. Um, as well as Japanese snowball viper, viburnum, uh, which is not a commonly invasive plant, but again, we've found a hundred or so of them in the forest and they don't really belong there. Um, so uh, kind of to continue on the um, really depressing path that we're on, uh, I want to talk about climate change for a minute too and how that impacts uh, the forest um, because it's going to completely change uh, the composition of trees and plants and even animals and all that stuff. Um, we're going to get uh, much stronger storms, um, much more wind and rain all at once. Um, there will be fewer rainstorms in general. Uh, but it will rain more kind of all at once in one time. Um, um, so there's this idea of um, like measuring dangerous heat. Uh, so in 1950, uh, 95 degree days, which is like the level of um, what's considered dangerous heat. Um, there were three days a year at 95 or more. Today, uh, there are five days at 95 or more on average. And in 30 years, there will be 30 days um, a year at 95 or more. Um, and with that level of heat, uh, it's really going to dry up the soil and um, really change what plants are growing here. And the plants that are here now will move north if they can. Um, other plants will move in and all sorts of things will change. Uh, but uh, that's also where um, we have a lot of potential in um, why I do what I do as well. Um, so what I can, what I do with uh, Friends of French Park and killing the honeysuckle and all that is really healing the forest. Um, and a healthy forest is much more resilient to climate change, uh, increasing the biodiversity um, even like the animals and all that uh, will really uh, help sequester carbon and store carbon in the long term. Um, and then also cleaning up our forests uh, really leads to cleaner air and cleaner water. Uh, I don't have time to get into it now, but again, happy to talk your ear off sometime about the effects of honeysuckle on water quality. Um, because if you just have a whole stream all the chemicals in, uh, or if you have a stream just completely covered in honeysuckle, all the chemicals are just leaching into the water. And um, yeah, some other time I'll talk about that. Uh, but if you get rid of the honeysuckle, it um, cleans, it cleans up the water. Um, uh, it makes room for other trees to grow. Um, there are studies coming out that uh, healthy landscapes, more trees, that kind of thing, uh, lead to better mental health outcomes. Uh, and it's also just safer in our parks so people can go outside and be in the parks more. Uh, if you're walking along in a tunnel, uh, 
a, a tunnel of honeysuckle along a trail. Uh, oftentimes you can't see 10 feet to one side or the other. If there's a turn, you have no idea what's around the turn. Uh, so getting rid of honeysuckle is really um, helps improve the safety and comfort level of pe people being in uh, our park system. Um, so what I do at with Friends of French Park, um, some of the background on that is that we started in uh, June of last year. Uh, French Park is an amazing park. I highly recommend checking it out, especially now that we've been working on it. Um, it's 275 acres, so it's a larger park. It's the second biggest in the Cincinnati park system. Uh, and I organize groups of volunteers uh, twice a month um, and then every Monday morning, almost every Monday morning. Um, and we do what needs to be done in the park, whether it's killing honeysuckle. Uh, we cleared six acres just in the a few months in the fall. Um, and that was like when we barely knew what was going on uh, organizationally. Uh, so I think this year we're going to do a lot more. Uh, we've planted 130 trees um, just in the last couple months, uh, 250 like flowers. Um, we've also planted like 600 acorns. And uh, in total, we've logged about uh, 1,400 volunteer hours. Um, so just really kind of like examining what is, um, what, what, like what needs to happen here uh, and then kind of triaging it really is what uh, we have been doing. Um, so a lot of what I've mentioned uh, so far uh, has been kind of depressing, uh, but uh, I think the potential uh, for the future is really exciting to create uh, these places again. Um, and I mean, we'll never like get back to what Ohio was like 200 years ago. Uh, like it's not like we're going to introduce reintroduce bison and elk and uh, wolves and mountain lions and stuff like that. Um, and we'll never have the exact same uh, plant com uh, combination of plants and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what we can do is save what's already here and heal what we already have and maybe expand it. Um, so three things that you can do, um, or that uh, really all people should do in my humble opinion, um, is uh, take care of the land that you are responsible for, whether it's like your yard or your apartment complex. I mean, that's complicated, but um, you can always lobby for uh, getting rid of honeysuckle and stuff like that. Um, if you have that capability, um, uh, and just really being like, what, uh, like what belongs here, uh, what, uh, doesn't belong here, that kind of thing. Um, another thing that you can do is volunteering, um, Friends of French Park is always looking for volunteers, uh, a lot of other Cincinnati parks are um, have a similar uh, volunteer group uh, that does similar things. Um, and if they don't, I can always put you in touch with uh, the volunteer person that the parks and you can make one, uh, which has been really fun, to be honest. Uh, and um, the other thing is we need more government response. Uh, our parks and forests uh, provide so much uh, benefit, so many benefits um, that we just really don't um, see on like a very surface level every day. Uh, and we're also just learning many, many more uh, benefits of having healthy forests and that kind of thing. Um, and it doesn't need to be a huge forest either. Like, um, pocket forests are um, becoming a very popular thing as well, like very small groups of trees. Um, and yeah, um, so I, I really think that kind of every piece of land needs to be managed. Um, in my own yard, uh, I have, I, I don't like use uh, any chemicals and stuff uh, to treat the lawn. And I have all sorts of 
um, invasive species pop up in my lawn because birds are carrying it in and uh, going potty and the, and then the seeds are still viable and um, grow and like, I'll have like uh, hundreds of sun, honeysuckle pop up in my yard every year. Um, so I think every piece of land, um, whether it's public or private, really needs to be managed for honeysuckle. And, I, and we'll never get rid of honeysuckle, but um, you know, one can dream. Uh, I also really believe in this idea, this concept of uh, rewilding, which is uh, not letting nature take its course, um, but reintroducing things that used to be here and um, can once or and can still be here again, but are not here right now. Uh, a lot of this comes with plants, at least. It comes down to um, right plant in the right place. Um, so thinking about like, what is a native plant? Um, I often see things like white pine uh, being sold in native plant sales, uh, which is uh, native to Ohio, but not native to Hamilton County or Cincinnati. It's native to like the Northeast uh, portion of Ohio. Um, so really finding plants that were originally indigenous uh, to the area, um, I think is really important. And the second part of that is uh, finding locally sourced plants. Um, so a lot of like big uh, nurseries will have like native plants, um, but they're pulling um, these species from uh, like several states away and that kind of thing where it's not the exact same um, plant. And when it um, mixes the genetics here uh, or with the plants that are already here, um, it kind of, it can lead to weird things, um, especially when um, the control of the, where the other plant came from and the genetics of it, the room. Um, are uh, not necessarily um, well-managed. Um, so you might end up with like cultivars and stuff. And I really think that we need to um, educate uh, pretty much everyone, I mean, public uh, and our leaders uh, who are making these decisions and things. Um, our parks are in pretty rough shape and um, there's a lot to do. <laughs> um, the park system, the Cincinnati park system is... 5,000 acres and 75% um, of it is forested. And um, most of it has honeysuckle. Um, there's some really great spots that I highly recommend checking out. Um, not a Cincinnati park, but Bender Mountain, uh, which is in Delhi, it's owned by Delhi. And um, they work closely with the Western Wildlife Corridor. Uh, I went there recently for the first time and it was absolutely spectacular. Um, just thousands of wildflowers. Uh, it really felt like walking into a very special place. Um, there were wildflowers there that I haven't seen anywhere else. Um, I also recommend uh, California Woods. Uh, kind of, I'm not sure, I guess in um, maybe the California neighborhood of Cincinnati, that would make sense. Um, it's on the east side near the river. And then um, uh, Buttercup Nature Preserve in uh, north side. So talked over the time, sorry about that. Uh, are there any questions or anything? You have such great information. I'm gonna go ahead and take you off of spotlights so that way we can see everyone here. And right. I see Lois has her hand up. Yes. Um, how do you kill honeysuckle in the park? <laughs> and uh, and then uh, I'd also like to hear of some, maybe a few native plants or that you recommend. Yeah. Um, so we uh, use what is generally referred to as um, like best management practices. Uh, so what we do is when we find it, um, if this is the stem, we cut it off about six inches from the bottom, and then um, we apply a pesticide to it. 
Uh, and we generally do it um, in the summer to early winter uh, because in the spring, uh, all the basically water nutrients juices of the plant are getting up. Um, but other times of the year, there's either more exchange or in the fall, um, all that moisture, all that um, stuff is heading down into the roots and it pulls in that um, pesticide much better. And um, I really had a lot of issues um, or dilemmas with like, oh man, we're using pesticide. Like uh, it's the devil basically. Uh, but I think that without it, it's pretty much a lost cause. And I think the scale of the amount that we're using is very minimal compared to uh industrial applications or agricultural applications, that kind of thing. Um, some native plants to uh, replace are um, uh, different viburnums. Um, they're, they're native and non-native viburnums, uh, uh, like dogwood trees, redbud trees. Um, oh, I'm completely blanking right now. Uh, if you're looking, so I think a lot of people have honeysuckle as like a um, kind of like a screen for privacy. Uh, a great native plant um, to replace it would be um, eastern red cedar. Uh, it's an evergreen. Uh, it's the only uh, conifer native to Hamilton County, and um, it's pretty quick growing. Uh, I, I, I'll, I can, I have other. Uh, plants species that I'll tell you when I remember them later. <laughs> there um, are many, like, I highly recommend just Googling it as well. There are many great resources out there. Let's do Tim and then Roland. Um, a, an announcement plus a question. Yeah. Church picnic is going to be at French Park this year, contrary to what the newsletter says. <laughs> so... Uh, I guess part of the question would be if you would be willing to uh, do some education work with us at French Park of what you're doing and show us the progress while we have our picnic. And the picnic is going to be on the 28th of May, which is Memorial Day weekend, that Sunday. The question I had is how does the honeysuckle add to the pollution of streams? Um, so uh, it's not necessarily, I don't know if pollution is the right term, um, but uh, there are a lot of different chemicals in um, the leaves, I believe, that uh, like when the leaves fall and um, enter the water in the fall, um, they those chemicals are harmful to the macro invertebrates that live in the water. Um, so like the um, crayfish, the larva, like insect larva, um, uh, all these non-vertebrate animals um, don't, it, it basically lowers the population of those. And oftentimes they kind of act as uh, like filter feeders uh, and eat things like algae and um, other things that are kind of oftentimes harmful to uh, the water supply. And honeysuckle is particularly damaging more so than any other plant that would drop its leaves. Uh, yeah, because of the chemicals. Um, I, I don't know where it fits on the scale. Um, I would assume that other plants are also um, uh, emitting similar chemicals on different uh, scales. But I I don't exactly have that data. Um, I know the um, McEwen, McEwen lab at the University of Dayton has um, done a lot of research and published a lot of um, articles on this topic. I've just kind of skimmed them, um, but uh, the McEwen lab at UD is a great resource for that. So the chemicals aren't necessarily polluting the water. They're killing off things that um, improve the water quality, is my understanding. Okay. 
Roland. Hi. Um, I just wanted to add on to uh, what Philip was saying about the eradication of the species. Uh, I mentioned to you last week that I spent over half a century battling honeysuckle. And uh, there are uh, uh, precautions that when you cut the honeysuckle down, that you have to apply the herbicide immediately. Otherwise, it grows back with a vengeance. It, it just ignores all you've done and it comes back uh, better than ever. <laughs> so, uh, it, it, and it is a, almost a losing battle. And sometimes people just say, well, it's just green wallpaper and uh, let, let it, uh, but the, the, the thing is that it has a habit of growing outward and smothering all the lovely native plants that grow. So it is in a sense that it's invasive. It really takes over and, and, and destroys uh, a very fine woodland. So it is an ongoing battle. So, uh, so that's it. <laughs> yeah, and more to that point, um, there are areas of French Park where in the past people just cut it down and didn't treat it with pesticide or anything. And you can't even walk through those areas. It's so thick. Um, and there are other areas where, uh, like you said, it has completely smothered everything underneath of it. It's just bare dirt underneath the honeysuckle. And um, what we see in a lot of places is that um, you have sometimes like invasive euonymus ivy on the ground and then honeysuckle and then um, invasive uh, porcelain berry, which is very similar to grapevine, um, that grows on top of the honeysuckle. And then there's literally nothing native in that uh, patch. Um, and oftentimes the another. trees are dead. Uh, English ivy is another one. Yeah, but we run into that a lot. Herbicide, you have to apply it on like in its full strength, not mm. diluted like it would normally. So you apply mm. it in full strength uh, to to do the job. Uh, another thing is that uh, I have a tool or two that's called a honeysuckle popper. Mm -hmm. And it's, it uses leverage to dig under the root and you got on a long handle and put all your weight on it and you pop the stump out. Uh, and that's another way of just physically removing it. Uh, the root system is kind of shallow and spreads out. And so that it's not really a deep rooted thing, but so you can get it out that way as well. Yeah, I've never used one of those. Um, the way that I started killing honeysuckle uh, is a little bit similar though, uh, with a fireman's ax, um, which is like an ax blade on one side and um, a flat uh, mattock on the other side. And I would like chop into the ground, sever the roots, and then turn the blade around and kind of use it as a pickaxe and pry it out that way. Um, but uh, that also kind of disturbs the soil. Uh, so you have a seed bank of seeds in there and oftentimes it's just more honeysuckle uh, and it's really hard to get all of the roots out. And if you don't, even, even if you leave like a small section of root in the ground, it will still re-sprout and grow back. But um, I have good, heard good things about the honeysuckle popper in general. Um, Denise, then Barbara, then Linda's question in the chat. On, on Sunday, uh, Ellen and I are gonna be at a table in the lobby. And Ellen's done a lot of work on where to buy native plants. And she'll have that information. And I have a list of native trees that are options. So if you want to stop at the table, maybe a couple of us can meet there and talk about trees more. Yeah, um, I had heard that you were doing that and forgot about that. Um, so thanks for pitching it. Um, but I think that's really wonderful. And um, <clears throat> providing those resources, is, I think, is a necessity to uh, helping people find, because I mean, 
there's you you don't know what you don't know a lot of times and uh i don't know just finding what is what is what when it comes to native plants and stuff um can be difficult and not always forthcoming and, and uh and Sunday's service, um, I'm also talking a little bit in that, and uh, my friend Tom is talking as well, and that should be much more uplifting than this talk, hopefully, so. <laughs> Barbara. Can you repeat the name, uh, the place that you saw, said you like to go in Delhi to um, see the native flowers? Uh, Bender Mountain. Bender? Uh, B E N. D E R. Mountain. And the mountain is not too much of an exaggeration. Um, there's some trails that are very nice that are um, kind of flat, uh, but you do ha have to kind of cross a little creek to get in, a big creek to get in there. Um, and then uh, I haven't been to the top uh, yet, but it does get uh, the incline increases rapidly at some point. Um, okay. But you could totally have like a very uh, easy stroll through um, and see just phenomenal wildflowers. And I, I highly recommend going like within the next few weeks um, because uh, the wildflowers that, that are up right now are called ephemerals uh, because they only last a few weeks at a time and then like they send their leaves and flowers up and then fade away for the rest of the year and you don't see them. Okay. And it sounds like my other question was, is going to be addressed at the church. Uh, I was wondering where to buy um, native plants. Since you said there were so many places they say they're selling native plants, but they're really not native plants. So mm. um, wondering if you have any specific recommendations at better sources. Um. I really like uh, Keystone Flora in Northside. Um, uh, it's run by uh, a guy named Steve, and he really makes sure to pull from lo local sources. Um, he doesn't really grow like big trees, um, in my understanding, uh, but anything smaller than that, uh, he, he has a lot of like really hard to find things. Um, I don't know of too many others um i mean i know of a few but i haven't like gone there and talked to them and made sure um but uh i think keystone flora it would be a great place to start okay thank you mm -hmm. so linda has put a question here in the chat what do you do with the honeysuckle that's been cut down <laughs> uh we do a couple things with it um we usually just drop it kind of where it is and then uh, lop it up or cut it up into pieces and it will decay uh, in, I don't know, the next five years or so. Uh, other times we use it to like block trails. So we'll just pile it up um, on a trail that's not being used anymore so that people don't go on it uh, because they're usually in really rough shape. Uh, Sometimes we build like little little piles of it for animal shelters, uh, for like rodents and birds and stuff like that. Because uh, if you're clearing like a massive area, uh, it opens up that to more predation um, of the small little woodland mice and stuff um, that also play an important role in the ecology. Clancy. One of the myths I've heard about, or I don't know, it sounds like it's a myth after what you just said, but that even the smallest part of it can cause it to grow back. How, what do you have to worry about with that? Like what parts of it could come back after you pulled it down? Uh, good question. So um, if you take out like the main root system, but leave like some of the roots in there, I mean, probably half an inch or bigger will come back and it will just send up a new stem with leaves. Um, and 
um, I mean, it, it's pretty easy to pull uh, just out of the ground. Um, like on a wet day, you could easily just like yank it out. Uh, the main concern becomes when you're managing a very large area like a park and um, you're not sure when you're going to get back to that spot and um, is it going to grow into another full-fledged plant um, because it will grow more roots eventually and just to my understanding basically regrow into what it was before okay um and i did want to say that the cincinnati nature center i don't know how good of a source they are they seem like they would be they're starting their native plant sale tomorrow uh, and then they just keep selling through the rest of the season basically um and also another good resource I found is bplant.org. Uh, bplant.org, it has a lot of good resources on what's actually native because that's one of the problems I've run into is going to some of the smaller native plant sales and actually no, some of these things are not in fact native. And I've accidentally bought non-native plants before that were supposedly native to my area. Um, but bee plant's really a good resource if you want to just like quickly check the name and make sure that it truly really is native to your specific area oh. yeah bplant.org cool i'll take a look at that for sure thanks for um uh, suggesting that uh and i've run into the exact same thing where you go to a native plant sale and you buy a plant and then later realize oh, this isn't actually native to hamilton county or southwest ohio um so yeah, uh, it sounds, I mean, just looking at pulling it up, um, looking at the homepage, it looks like it is a great resource for like exactly what you just said. We have time, I think, for one more question. Roland. Yeah, I just have a comment. Uh, if you want another pest, plant, uh, consider the garlic mustard, which people go out in great bunches and pick that stuff up because it's, it's easy to pull, but <laughs> it's a major pest. Uh, also, I put in a good word again for Keystone Flora. Uh, the, the folks there are very knowledgeable and have just lots of native plants that they propagate. Uh, it's off of Winton Road, off of King's Run, and then Wooden Shoe Hollow. It's a unique Cincinnati area that's you ought to see. Yeah, uh, it, it definitely took me aback the first time I went there. I was like, where am I? Um, it was very uh, unexpected. Um, and with uh, garlic mustard, uh, it's uh, garlic mustard season right now. Um, it's a woodland uh, plant. Uh, it grows, I don't know, six inches to three feet tall and um, produces a whole bunch of seeds and can completely take over an area uh, mm -hmm. in the forest. Um, so if you go on a um, hike anytime in the near future uh, and you see these plants with little tiny white flowers at the top um, and kind of arrow shaped leaves uh that's garlic mustard and uh the next friends of french park event i believe is going to be all about garlic mustard and at the last one uh we finished planting the plants and uh in one little area we pulled out um like 15 or 20 uh kroger bags of a plant um so it's quite prolific as well there's a lot of work to do in general. <laughs> so yeah. Well, Philip, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Yeah, and thank you so much for listening. Uh this was just kind of the depressing tip of the iceberg. <laughs> um if you want uh to talk about plants, I'm more than happy to. Uh and Rebecca will appreciate it. So. <laughs> thank you. And thanks Meredith for organizing and uh facilitating thank all of you for coming.
All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Good Thanks. Night. Good night. Bye. Thanks, Philip. Thanks, Philip. Bye.